Hi everyone. It is Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe Wednesday. So I am here to read you chapter 11 of Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe. And um, we're going to find out how Edmund is doing with the White Witch and see what the other children and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are up to. Did they make it to the stone table? Let's find out. So chapter 11 is titled, Aslan is Nearer. Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready, he expected that the witch would start being nice to him as she had been at their last meeting. But she said nothing at all. And when at last Edmund plucked up his courage to say, Please, your majesty, could I have some Turkish delight? You, you said, she answered, Silence, fool! Then she appeared to change her mind and said, As if to herself, And yet it will not do to have that brat fainting on the way and once more clapped her hands another dwarf appeared bring the human creature food and drink she said the dwarf went away and presently returned bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it he grinned in a repulsive manner as he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince. Ha, ha, ha. Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. I don't want dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face that he apologized and began to nibble at the bread, though it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You might be glad enough of it before you taste bread again, said the witch. While he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white witch rose and went out ordering Edmund to go with her. The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. But before they drove off, she called Margram, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to the side of the sledge. Take with you the swiftest of your wolves and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make all speed to the stone table, but do not be seen. Wait for me there in hiding. I meanwhile must go many miles to the west before I find the place where I can drive across the river. So you may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. I hear and obey, O queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and darkness as quickly as a horse can gallop. In a few minutes, he had called another wolf and was and was with him down on the dam and sniffing at the beaver's house. But of course, they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children if the night had remained fine, for the wolves would then have been able to follow their trail. And ten to one would have overtaken them before they had gotten to the cave. But now that the snow had begun again, the scent was cold and even the footprints were covered up. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and the cold. 
This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat. Before they had been going quarter of an hour, all of the front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off, because as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him king at all. King. All of the things he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind and that her side was really the right side sounded to him silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. This lasted longer than I could describe, even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight. And still they went on and on with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harnesses. And then at last the witch said, What have we here? Stop! And they did. How Edmund hoped she was going to say something about breakfast. But she had stopped for quite a different reason. A little way off, at the foot of a tree, sat a merry party. A squirrel and his wife with their children and and two satyrs and a dwarf and an old dog fox, all on stools around a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely, and there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure that he didn't see something like plum pudding. At the moment when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously the oldest person present, had just risen to its feet, holding a glass in its right paw as if it was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping and who was in it, all, sorry, all the fun went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating and his fork halfway to his mouth and one of the satars stopped with its fork actively in its mouth and the baby squirrels squeaked with terror. What is the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak vermin, she said again. Or do you want my dwarf to find your tongue with his whip? What is the meaning of all this gluttony? With waste, this self-indulgence, where did you get all these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox. We were given them. And if I might make so bold as to drink to your majesty's very good health. Who gave them to you, said the witch. F -f 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 Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What? roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you but no? Say you have been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels lost its head completely. He has, he has, he has, it squeaked, beating its little spoon on the table. 
Edmund saw the witch bite her lips so that a drop of blood appeared on her white cheek. Then she raised her wand. Oh, don't! Please don't! shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting, she had waved her wand and instantly, where the merry party had been, there were only statues of creatures, one with its stone fork fixed forever halfway to its stone mouth. Seated around the stone table in which there were stone plates and stone plum pudding. So what had happened here was the witch had turned them all to stone because they were having a celebration with the things that Father Christmas had given to them. And she's angry that Father Christmas is now in Narnia because she knows what that means. Her magic is failing if Father Christmas was able to get in to Narnia. When they refer to these creatures now sitting at a stone table, they are not talking about the stone table where Aslan is to meet the children. They are talking about, they were sitting at a little table and now the witch has turned that table into stone. As for you, said the witch, giving Enman a stunning blow to the face as she remounted the sledge. Let that teach you to ask a favor of spies and traitors. Drive on. And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seems so pitiful to think of those little stone figures sitting there all the silent days and all the dark nights, year after year, till the moths grew on them and at last even their faces crumbled away. Now they were steadily racing on again, and soon Edmund noticed that the snow, which splashed against them as they rushed through it, was much wetter than it had been all night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew foggier and warmer and the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up till now. At first, he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as if it had as if it had stuck against stones. And however the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer, the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them. But the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarf shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast that it wouldn't go at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence, and in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he'd heard it before. If only he could remember where. Then all of the sudden, he did remember. It was the noise of running water. All around them, throughout, all around them, though out of sight, there were streams chattering, mummering, bubbling, splashing, and even in the distance, roaring. And his heart gave a great leap, though he hardly knew why. Then he realized that the frost was over and much nearer there was a drip, drip, drip from the branches of all the trees. And then as he looked at one tree, he saw a great load of snow slide off it. And for the first time since he'd entered Narnia, he saw the dark green of a fir tree. 
but he hadn't time to listen or watch any longer. For the witch said, Don't sit staring, fool! Get out and help! And of course, Edmund had to obey. He stepped out into the snow, but it was really only slush by now, and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole it had gotten into. They got it out in the end, and by being very cruel to the reindeer, the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they drove a little further. And now the snow was really melting in earnest and patches of green grass were beginning to appear in every direction. Unless you have looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. And then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge in this thaw. So remember, the white witch's power made it an eternal winter. Remember, always winter, but never Christmas. So the first sign of her powers fading was that Father Christmas was be able to enter Narnia. Now, spring is coming. So that says a lot about her powers. Then we must walk, said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf. Not with the start they got. Are you my counselor or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of the human creature behind it and keep hold of the end of the rope and take your whip and cut the harness of the reindeer. They'll find their own way home. The dwarf obeyed, and in a few minutes, Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind his back. He kept on slipping in the slush and mud and wet grass, and every time he sl slipped, the dwarf gave him a curse and sometimes a flick with the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, Faster! Faster! Every moment the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes, you saw the dark green of firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest floor and overhead you could see a blue sky between the treetops. Soon there were more wonderful things happening Coming suddenly around a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with yellow flowers. The noise of water grew louder. Presently, they actually crossed a stream. Behind it, they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them. And he gave the rope a vigorous jerk. But of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later, he noticed a dozen, a dozen crocuses growing around the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white. Then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of water. Close behind the path they were following, a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird a little further off. And then, as if that had been a signal, 
There was chattering and chirping in every direction and then a moment of full song and within five minutes the whole wood was ringing with birds music. And, what, and wherever Edmund's eyes turned, he saw birds alighting on branches and sailing overhead or chasing one another or having their little quarrels, or tidying up their feathers with their beaks. Faster, faster, said the witch. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there were white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the wide glades, there were primroses, a light breeze sprang up, which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the face of the travelers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and birches were covered with green. The lumberous with, the lumberous with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thaw, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed, I tell you. This is Aslan's doing. If either of you mentions the name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. And that's the end of chapter 11. So spring is really popping up everywhere. The snow is melting, the birds are chirping, the leaves are growing trees, there's all kinds of flowers growing, um, the ice that was freezing up the rivers and the streams and the lakes has melted. That's what Edmund can hear off in the distance is running water. Um, the sun is coming out, it's warming the forest, it's a happy time. And the witch is not happy about it. And so her powers are really weakening as Aslan is in Narnia and is continuing to get closer to the children. So, so far, as long as the witch doesn't find the other three, it looks like maybe the prophecy about the four thrones of Char Parvel. If those four children can sit in those thrones, the witch, her, her days of ruling will be over. But we'll see what happens. We'll see if, uh, if the witch gets to the stone table before the children in Aslan. We'll have to read further and find out. So we are already doing kind of a large writing project this week with our Compare and Contrast of Ants and Bees. So I'm not actually going to have you write anything about chapter 11. Um, I am going to tell you to go ahead and do your lap book page. And it's only one little page for your lap book this time. And it looks like this. And it says, Edmund was hoping for more Turkish delight when he saw the queen. What did he get instead? So what did you get for food instead of Turkish delight? So you're just going to write the, you're going to cut this out. Don't cut here because you have to fold it. So you're going to cut this out and then you're going to fold it and write your answer on the inside and then you can glue it into your lap book. Send me a picture of your answer. And then I did think that it would be sort of fun um, since we're doing, again, since we're doing a different writing project this week. I thought it would be fun for you to do a sort of a little art activity for
for this chapter instead of doing answering any questions or anything like that. Um, so I want you to draw or you can build it. You can with Legos or clay or whatever you want. Use your imagination. Uh, you can, if you have paint at home and it's okay with mom and dad, um, you could paint the picture, whatever you want to do. Um, draw me a picture or build me or paint something like that. <clears throat> a picture, um, or a small model. I guess, depending on if you build it or not, of the party that the animals were having before they were turned to stone. Um, as the witch came upon them, they were having a little party. Um, Father Christmas had given them some good things to eat. And go ahead and draw or build or paint or whatever a little model or drawing or painting of that scene with the animals in the forest of that animal party. Before we finish, right before the last page, there were some pictures that I want to share with you. Um, so this is a picture of the witch and the dwarf and Edmund as they're walking and then here's some pictures of some of the things that Edmund was trying to describe. Some of the flowers and things that were coming to life in the forest because spring was coming. Or it was spring. Um, so let me, before you... Um, lastly... Let me review for you or go over for you. Um, let me just read that part about the animal party again. Since you don't have a book at home or you may not have a book at home. So that it'll be easier for you to do your little art project. Okay. So let's see. Uh, let me just find the part. A little way off at the foot of a tree sat a merry party. Merry meaning they're, they're happy. A squirrel and his wife and their children. Two sitars and a dwarf and an old dog fox. All on stools around a table. Edmund thought he saw something that looked like plum pudding. They were eating. There was a decoration of holly. So that's probably all the information that you need to try to do a model of the animal party. So when you're done... Go ahead and take a picture of it for me and send it to me. I'm looking forward to see what boys and girls come up with. So um, I thought it might be something fun for you to do. Um, and I'm excited to see what you, what you have and sort of how your imagination works um, when you hear the story, but pictures aren't provided for you. I think it's, it's wonderful. Okay, boys and girls, I look forward to seeing your projects. Bye-bye.